I've made plenty of painful mistakes as a filmmaker, so today's a bit of a therapy session. Let's talk about some of them. And joining me for this video is Seb, who's been making documentaries for the past 15 years. So I'm curious to find out if he's made any of the same mistakes that I have. Hopefully I'm not the only one. So my first mistake happened on my first documentary back in 2014. I remember at the time I thought I was looking for a story, but really I was just looking for any people or situations that I considered interesting. My brother loved running and so I thought I'd make a film about his passion for the sport. But instead of telling a story, what I ended up making was basically just a sequence of sound bites, highlights from an interview where my brother describes his thoughts and feelings about running. Looking back, what's missing is conflict. Basically nothing goes wrong during the mini doc. The closest I got to showing any conflict was my brother describing the feeling of exhaustion during a tough race. I wish that I'd been able to find some drama or conflict. If it had been disqualified from an important race or encountered a dangerous animal, then we might have a story on our hands. Now obviously for a doc you don't want to fabricate any conflict, but I really wish that I had pointed the interview questions and the editing towards some kind of jeopardy. So for example, I do know that my brother dealt with some injuries in his running career, so asking him about that would have at least set up what the character wants to be able to run again, and something that gets in the way, an injury. It took me years to have that realisation, so now I try and keep an eye out for conflict from the very beginning, planning the project, all the way through to the final edit. I'm constantly asking myself, what's going wrong for the character? When I'm struggling to find the conflict, I like to think about what the character wants, because ambitious people tend to run into more obstacles, and I reckon that's where some of the best stories are. Now Seb, I'm curious if you've made the same mistake as well. So when I started making films, I wanted everything to go really well for the protagonist, but I quickly realised that without conflict, a film is pretty boring. As well as including conflict in your documentary, it's also important to include stakes. For example, what's at stake if the character doesn't achieve their goal? Is it their relationship, a friendship, or maybe something even more extreme like their life? The higher the stakes in a film, the more engaging it will be for audiences. A time when I failed to make the most of the stakes in a film is when making my short documentary One Breath in 2015. The main character, Christina, was attempting a world record dive. I thought I'd asked enough questions in the interview, but it wasn't until I'd finished and released the film that I discovered that Christina had in fact attempted this world record previously and she'd passed out from decompression sickness. And what's more, someone had filmed it. I was kicking myself because I'd never asked Christina if she'd tried this world record attempt before. And I didn't ask her what the consequences were if she failed. By not asking enough questions and trying to unlock the stakes of her story, I missed out on the opportunity to include an additional scene that would have shown how dangerous her attempt really was, increasing the conflict and the stakes so the audience would have been far more invested in whether or not she achieved her world record attempt. So Simon, I'm curious, have you ever made this mistake? For sure, I think every single doc I've made, I look back and realise, yep, yeah, the stakes were not high enough. Now I can handle being on camera if I'm filming myself, but as soon as someone else is filming me, I tend to feel quite self-conscious. So generally when I'm filming other people, I assume that they're gonna be a bit uncomfortable with it. Now, there's a fine line though between being sensitive to that and being a pushover. A few years ago, I was definitely on the wrong side of that line. I was shadowing a documentary crew in Florida and I didn't want to inconvenience too many people. So I only asked to interview the director. Now, I will never know what kind of stories or ideas might have come from those interviews, and maybe they would have been quite happy to be on camera, but I never found out. Plus on that shoot, I also used the camera's built-in microphone for a couple of interviews, because again, I didn't want the hassle of asking the director to stop what they're doing and put on a wireless mic. Like, considered this project, for example, I didn't really know a lot about ballet. I knew that the sound quality would suffer. It's one of the first things you learn about sound is not to use the camera's built-in mic, but I did it anyway. So those are two examples of how my lack of boldness harmed my projects. Since then, I've shifted my goal away from trying to minimize inconvenience. And now my goal is to try and build a rapport with the people I'm filming. I still have to make an effort to be bold, but if I know that people are on board with the project, then I don't feel so awkward asking them to do things for the film. So Seb, I'd like to know if you've ever been too timid on a documentary shoot. Yeah, for sure. I always find it really hard putting people out in order to get the shot that you need. So as a child, I grew up in New Zealand and I was making films all by myself. 
because there was no one in my area that was also passionate about filmmaking. And it was either making films by myself or not making them at all. Then this continued into my professional career and I would do everything. So I would edit, shoot, write the stories, everything like that. And as a result, my career plateaued very early on. When I was working by myself, I'd often get stuck as I didn't know how to move forward or what to do next. For example, with my short film One Breath, I got into such a rut with the story that I abandoned it for two years. And it wasn't until I collaborated with an editor and was able to bounce ideas back and forth with the editor that I finalized the story. Then I got a sound designer, colorist and composer on board to help finish the film. And the film is what it is today, thanks to them. So now whenever I'm stuck in a project or I'm struggling either to find the motivation or I'm not sure what to do next, I make sure I ask for help. Also, whenever I'm making a documentary, I make sure to build a team around me so it's not just me making films because that can be a real challenge otherwise. But knowing how to find people to collaborate with can be really tough. And this was something I found hard when I first started out. 80% of my filmmaking contacts have come from working on other people's films. So I'd recommend working on other people's projects and going that extra mile as it's a brilliant way to meet like-minded individuals and potential crew members. It's fine to start making films by yourself. That's how most of us learn. But as you grow and expand, it's really important to collaborate. And if you don't, it can be a big mistake. Simon, have you ever made this mistake? Oh yeah, I've always worn too many hats. I usually wish there was another pair of hands on set. It's so easy to underestimate how much B-roll is needed for a documentary. I think most beginners make this mistake, at least I hope so, because I've been making films for a while and I made this mistake literally on a project I'm working on right now. This documentary is probably gonna run for 20 minutes, my longest film to date. But once we started editing, I realized we only had half the B-roll that we need. What's worse though, is that it would have been so easy to capture more footage. It's not like we didn't have enough time. I just thought that we had enough B-roll. Next time, I wanna take every opportunity. I feel like I've recalibrated my sense of what enough B-roll is. So Seb, have you had this problem? It's funny you should say that because I actually have the opposite problem. I overshoot, so I need to make sure I'm more disciplined and only get what I really need. So this is one of my biggest mistakes. And I think a lot of people can probably resonate with this. And that's putting all my self-worth into my filmmaking. And it makes complete sense because at school I was bullied a lot and things only started to change when I started to focus on filmmaking. I suddenly felt like I was worth something because people were watching my films and enjoying them and asking questions. It was almost like having a camera and being a filmmaker was my superpower and shield, which felt great, but I became hooked on this feeling. I became obsessed with being a successful filmmaker. I was working so much that every few months I'd burn out and struggle to get out of bed, all because my drive for success wasn't coming from a healthy approach of striving for excellence, but instead from a need for social validation. So by the time I was 24, I was exhausted and depressed. I didn't know what to do next. I didn't know what was important. I just felt burnt out. And so I took some time off and I reconnected with what was most important which was nature, family, friends. And all of a sudden I felt alive again. And I suddenly realized that I didn't need filmmaking to feel like I was enough. Six years on, I still struggle from time to time to feel like I'm enough outside of filmmaking. For example, if I don't capture an important story moment the way I imagine, I beat myself up about it. But I have to remind myself that even if I'm not framing every shot perfectly and winning lots of awards, I'm still enough. So Simon, I'm curious, is this something that you struggle with as well? Definitely. I mean, so much of my identity is wrapped up in my work. It's always the first thing that I talk about when someone asks what I've been up to. So I think that is a red flag. But you know what? I think that's enough vulnerability for one day. I really thought I'd get used to this, but I still feel a bit uneasy about sharing this stuff, particularly the mistakes that I'm still working on at the moment. Now, if you'd like to hear more from Seb, he's made an online film school called Documentary Film Academy. He's put together a free one hour training video with tips for creating cinematic documentaries. Now that training video is free to watch. So if you're interested, you can click the link in the description and sign up with your email address. So thanks for joining me, Seb. I'm Simon Cade. This has been DSLR Guide and I'll see you next time.